again, everybody. Scott Casper, Takedown Wrestling Media. We continue our coverage of the sport today. We head to Colorado Springs, the parking lot of the Olympic <laughs> Training Center, sitting in his car, taking the call and taking it like a, a coach should. He jo- jumps into the Nike hot seat today, does the nas- assistant national coach, Brendan Slay. Brendan, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Scott. Congratulations, first of all, on a tremendous amount of uh, success in your life. But the that what you're doing with the kids, the uh, uh, youngsters, and of course the senior level athletes as well, they respect you and what you've been able to teach, what you have to give, and they listen. Well, thank you very much. It's been uh, it's been an honor over the last two plus years to be the national development coach, which means I'm responsible for all of our cadets and juniors, so the 15 through 20 year olds. And since Bruce Burnett became our national coach after Zeke Jones left, he um, put me in that role. And so it's just been an honor to hopefully have a, a positive influence on those young men in regards to wrestling, but more importantly, their lives. We talked a little bit about some of the things that are going on in the, in the sport, and it seems like you're everywhere and everywhere. And I, everywhere I am, there you are, but your job is so expansive. Uh, it touches so many lives in so many ways. Let's talk a bit about... What's going on at the OTC this week? It's National Teams Training Week, is it not? Originally, we were going to have a national team camp in Lake Placid, New York, right after the Bill Farrell International, just since Lake Placid to New York City was fairly close. But at Lake Placid, we found out they were only going to be able to give us two mats, which is not much space, and then we couldn't get the Russians and the Koreans and the Chinese international guys to commit to training with us so we made a decision just to just to have the camp here at the olympic training center this week and this is our second day and um we have jordan burroughs out here and david taylor and kyle snyder and and you just a, a host of our other national team members so it's been yesterday was a great first day we spent most of the day getting better leg laces and today we've spent a lot of time this morning um blocking and clearing underhooks how difficult is the uh Pardon me. How difficult are the politics of wrestling when you say you couldn't get the Russians and the Koreans and so on and so forth together uh, for practice? Is, is it become political at some some level? Well, I think there's there's politics involved uh, pretty much in every organization of life. <laughs> so I don't think you can avoid it. Uh, but I think the challenge becomes with the international teams is that it's sometimes tough to communicate with their coaches because the Russian coaches don't speak English. The Korean coaches don't speak English. So you're having to email back and forth with their delegation. And if they don't get right back in contact with you, then, I mean, you're trying to make decisions to have a camp at Lake Placid at at the Olympic training center there, you know, based on current information from Russia, Korea, China. And when you don't get that, it becomes a challenge because, they're asking you, well, how many beds do you need here? And you're like, well, we could potentially need 24 up to 50. <laughs> and that's a, bit, that's a big difference. Right. So in the end, when, when you can't get the exact information you need, we know what we're going to get at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. I mean, Bill Zadick and I both live here. Bruce Burnett comes in here a lot from Idaho. So we know what we're going to get here. And so that way, I, I think it was just better to bring our group of guys here. You talk a little bit about uh... – interpreters and it seems to me it would be on the individuals that are traveling to supply an interpreter or is it the other way around well it would it would definitely you know behoove all these international teams to have someone who speaks english and someone who could communicate with us on a timely fashion but you know that's that's our hope that's our wish that's our want but that doesn't always happen i mean Mm. for us when we travel to russia uh, fortunately we have a guy you know named polly uh keyblitz who is, uh, you know, he's he's been a referee for many, many years. He's uh, on the board there at the NYC, and he speaks Bulgarian, Polish, and Russian. Yep. And so he's been a huge asset for us, taking us all, you know, being an interpreter all around the world. But it's a little tougher when we go to Iran or, um, you know, sometimes countries maybe like Cuba or Spain when we might not have somebody that's fluent in, in um, Farsi for Iran or you know, or Spanish. So it becomes a little tricky sometimes. No, oh, I got to believe language is the ultimate barrier and uh, hasn't it always been lack of understanding of each other. We're talking with Brandon Slay, uh, the assistant national coach 
uh, boots on the ground in Colorado Springs. You'll usually find him and Coach Zadick hard at work. If not there, they're on an airplane somewhere with parts of their team or all of their team and heading to competition around the world. And uh, that's got to be a fun part of it, yet that kind of drags on you a little bit. I would say, you know, one of the most enjoyable parts of our job is that we get a chance to travel the world. I think that we've been to my last almost seven years on staff here. I've been to almost 40 countries around the world. So getting a chance to see the world and and coach these guys and influence their lives in a positive way, it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a dream job. And yes, I got a degree in finance from the Wharton School of Business, the University of Pennsylvania, and I wanted to be a businessman and businessman. And I did that for a while, uh, for five years in Dallas, but I just missed Olympism. I missed, um, I missed the, just being in the wrestling room. I missed helping guys on their double leg. I missed having the opportunity to coach a guy to beat a Russian or Iranian and, and just the, just the joy that comes from that. So, and I chose to get back in the wrestling world in the last seven years has been, it's been a great opportunity and I've loved my job and um, but, but it's tough because you know, I've, I'm married and I have three kids. I have a f- four-year-old daughter, a two-year-old daughter, and a, a two-month-old daughter. And so <clears throat> I think, you know, my wife, she's the true hero because when I take off to, like I'm about to go to Nice, France during Thanksgiving, I'll be gone for eight days. I mean, she'll be here in Colorado Springs taking care of all three girls by herself. So, you know, that's the tough part is leaving your family, leaving your spouse, leaving your kids behind. So, I mean, we have to work hard to, to try to find the balance in that and then be very present to our families when we're home. Yeah, that's uh, it's a difficult task, a difficult task indeed, but you love your family, and you'll do whatever you can to make it work. Brandon Slay, our guest, Olympic gold medalist, and uh, one of my favorites. It was a, uh, a difficult road to get there, but boy, did he absolutely represent the United States in his pursuit. Brandon, I do want to talk to you about some hopes and dreams, and it was this last weekend the Bill Farrell International took place at the New York AC. One of the young men that stood up, we start with Jordan Oliver, Tempe, Arizona, Sunkiss Kids. He stunned the New York crowd with a a last-second victory over Logan Stever, the four-time NCAA champ. What did you see in Jordan Oliver over the weekend? I saw confidence in him. I haven't really seen in a while. I saw his his shape, um, his overall just kind of physical shape was better than it's been. I think he recovered really well from his weight cut. So those are all positive signs. And he was very explosive. For example, he was behind Logan Stieber at the very end of that match. He had to go get a takedown to win in the last approximately 25 seconds. Um, he set him up level change, you know, attacked Logan Stieber, got to the leg and, and finished. He ended up finishing a four-pointer. And Logan Stieber, in many ways, kind of threw himself to his back. But but still, if Jordan Oliver wouldn't have had the courage to take that shot, then he wouldn't have won the match. And Logan Stieber would have won. And Logan Stieber would have qualified for the Olympic trials early. So that, that was the best I've seen Jordan Oliver wrestle in a while. And, and I'm excited to take him to, to Nice, France, where we leave November 23rd. We're gone the 30th. And, and Logan Stieber and Ed Ruth and Kyle Dake and Joe Cologne and um, there's, there's just, uh, there's about 12 other wrestlers going with us on that trip. So that should be a really good one. As big as that rivalry is between Steve and Oliver, is that a difficult trip for two guys like that to take as competitive as they are? Well, I don't think Steve is going to go to France. Okay. Jordan Oliver is. I, maybe I misunderstood yeah. you. Yeah, but no, Kyle Dake, um, Ed Ruth. Okay. Joe Cologne, those guys are going to France. Then but I definitely misunderstood you. Those, I mean, the rivalry is intense. Yeah. But you know what? The rivalry is very intense, but but I feel like as intense as the rivalry is, I mean, right now, this morning, you know, David Taylor and Jordan Burroughs, they've had a pretty intense rivalry in the past, being both guys at 74 kilo. I mean, David Taylor was, you know, inches away from beating Jordan Oliver in 2014, the U.S. Open. I mean, he was beating him and he <clears throat> beating Jordan Burroughs and Jordan Burroughs, you know, took him down you know, in the last um, seven seconds, twice to win. So my point is you, you have a David Taylor, Jordan, all, I mean, Jordan Burroughs, that rivalry is pretty intense. And here they are here at the Olympic Training Center, and they're, they're training together. They're encouraging each other. They're helping each other get better. So I, I think we have, you know, we have some very, um, we have some class acts that, that are top-level wrestlers, and I think they, they handle that well. You know, they don't feel like I'm going to ignore you. I'm not going to talk to you. When we're in the cafeteria. I'm going to ignore you. And, um, I think some of our best wrestlers we have and some of the best wrestlers in the world, they handle that with integrity. 
I think a great example of that would be uh, of, of the aging veterans, uh, Stan Desick and, and Wade Chalice, uh, two guys that have learned to get along uh, together. And, and it, I mean, they sit across from each other. They sit down the row from each other. Uh, and that that is a, it's an aging story for sure, but still one that's fresh in my memory. Banks, we're well, talking. You, there's yeah, there's there's a time to be competitors when you walk out on the mat, shake hands when you're wrestling that guy. But when you step off the mat, you're part of Team USA again. And when you travel overseas to a tournament, you know we're going overseas wearing the red, white, and blue. You know we're not wearing our college warm ups and our college singlets. We're wearing U- Team USA singlets. And so if you're not competing with that person during that six minute match, you need to see them as your teammate and. You know, for example, now David Taylor is going up to 86 kilos. So Jordan Burroughs doesn't see him so much as somebody that he's competing against. Jordan Burroughs sees him as somebody that he wants to help, you know, sharpen and and develop so David Taylor can become the best. He can beat 86 kilos. And I think that's the attitude that that our top wrestlers need to take. And it's a tough balance for sure, but sometimes we've got to man up. We've got to be a man or a Amen. woman. Uh, Jordan Oliver was named Outstanding Wrestler because of his effort in freestyle for his performance there, and that proved out to be a really deep field at 65. The United States won five of the six weight classes contested there. What did you see overall from Team USA as they begin to develop? Uh, you know, they're, they're getting their chops in and, and, and making their way toward Iowa City. The Olympic trials coming up in April. Olympic trials are coming very fast, as you mentioned. One thing I did see is, as I saw uh, the Bill Farrell, that was the deepest um, it's ever been. It's the deepest the uh, you know NYC Bill Farrell International has ever been. So it was great to see when you got to the quarterfinals, you were seeing the NCAA champ against NCAA champ, and you know it was it was the most enjoyable as a as a coach for me to kind of be there and to watch those matches. And I saw a lot of our guys there; uh, they're getting in better shape early as they should be, because. You know, the Olympic trials qualifier in December for every person that didn't win, you know, they're going to have to qualify for the Olympic trials in December. And clearly the, the international tours at the end of January and February are coming up really soon. And then we have the Pan Am championships at the end of February. We have the Pan Am qualifier or freestyle team USA. We still need to qualify, you know, four more weight classes for the Olympic games. And then of course, April is going to be here. The trials are going to be here before you know it. So to answer your question, I saw a group of wrestlers that were, that we're realizing that and getting in shape pretty early. So I was, uh, I was glad to see that. You know, and, and, and I think that's probably the best observation, just that general observation. I liked uh, Tyler Graf um, as, a, as, a, as a wrestler. He showed me some, a lot of heart. You know, with uh, posting two tech balls in a tournament of that nature is difficult in, at best. What are yeah. your thoughts? Well, and, and I think Tyler Graf did a great job, but on the flip side of that, Another thing I saw, which is this, this is another one of my responsibilities, as we mentioned, at USA Wrestling as being the national development coach. So I saw a guy named Stevan Micic, who was third in the junior worlds this year, um, wrestle Tyler Graff first round and have a, have a commanding lead on him. I think it was 10 to 4. And uh, Tyler Graff had to come back and get the takedown in the last 10 seconds to beat Stevan Micic, who is still a junior, age group wise. And so you saw Anthony Valencia and Zahid Valencia um, and Stevan Micic. We saw some of our top juniors compete in a senior level tournament as well. And so I was, I was really glad to see those guys there, you know, battling instead of going, Oh, we're still juniors. We're not old enough yet. Um, clearly Aaron Pico is still a junior. And so Aaron Pico ends up, he loses to Frank Molinaro, comes back, redeems the loss and gets bronze and, you know, in the Bill Farrell. And that was the only match he lost. It was to Molinaro and he redeemed himself. So for him to get third in the Bill Farrell, 65 kilos behind Jordan Oliver, Logan Steber, and then, you know, Aaron Pico, to see those developmental guys compete to that level, you know, that kind of uh, got me pumped as the national development coach. <laughs> yeah, like J.D. Bergman is one of those guys that's just consistently in there. Uh, a lot of heart, tremendous faith. Uh, you know, he, he was able to, to defeat uh, Dustin Kilgore, another one of those exceedingly strong guys. You know, when you think of Dustin Kilgore in your mind, perhaps you think he's six foot three. <laughs> uh, he just is a bigger guy in your mind than he is, you know, on the mat. But boy, man, I tell you what, when you get after it with a guy like that at 97 kilos, uh, that's, that's going to be a great battle on any day, either one of those two guys. Well, and, and JD Bergman is one of my favorite, you know, guys in wrestling. I've had the opportunity to coach him at the 2010 world champs in Moscow. 
I mean, he's been one of the top 97 kilos for six or seven years now, made two world teams. And so he's clearly one of the best guys, um, you know, in the country, one of the best guys in the world. And so I was proud of him of winning that tournament. But on the flip side, the third part of my job, you know, I was the resident coach at the Olympic Training Center. Dustin Kilgore is a guy I coach on a daily basis. So uh, I, I, was, I was happy to see Dustin. You know, he, he teched Kale Byers in the semifinals and then wrestled the best match he's ever wrestled against JD, only losing seven to five. So, uh, again, to see our guys just continuing to progress, continuing to get better as a coach for Team USA, that's what we want to see. That's what I like to see. When you think of Hart, you think of John Reeder. Uh, I don't know that there's been anybody that's put it out there and been more available emotionally. Uh, he wrestles hard every single second on that mat, whether it's in practice or in competition. He had a tough time against 2014 U.S. World Team member Ed Ruth, uh, now training in Tempe, Arizona, which I think has been really good for him, internationally speaking. He's with the Sunkiss Kids. So it was Ruth who topped Johnny Reeder. It's 13-0, though. That really doesn't tell the whole story of John Reeder, does it? No, it, it doesn't. Uh, I mean, John's... He's wrestled Ed Ruth closer matches than that, but he's also, I mean, Ed Ruth last year at the national tournament um, took him down leg lace and attacked him 10 0. So you know, John, John's wrestled Ed closer, and, and I think he knows that um, he could wrestle better than he did in the finals. And, you know, I got to talk to John um, after the finals and, and kind of talk to him about his offense and, you know, give him some pointers. Actually, as, as you may know, I coached him here at the Olympic Training Center before he went off to South Dakota State to start coaching there. So, I mean, that's the whole thing is that as a, as a, as a assistant national coach, again, it's my responsibility to develop and help all these guys, um, but also come back and I have to focus on the guys that train here with me at the Olympic Training Center and then make sure I'm on the phone to the Stevon Mitrich's, the Aaron Picos and the Valencia's and the Yanni Doc Mahalis's and the Jared McLaren's to make sure that those guys are getting everything they need to develop for future Olympic and gold medals. And I don't know what you say in, in a 13-0 performance on the, to the guy, John Reeder, in this case, who scored zero, uh, about his offense. Because truly, clearly, a lack of offense. If there had been offense, we would have seen score. Uh, and that's hardly a knock on John Reeder, gosh. Well, you just tell him, I mean, John chased Ed too much. He took too many big steps and just kind of chased after him and ran after him. And that's why Ed Ruth was able to level change and, and get to John's legs a lot easier and and score big points. And, you know, Ed Ruth is one of the fastest, one of the most explosive wrestlers we have. I um, mean, just like, you know, Jordan Bros is clearly really quick, really explosive. You know, guys like that, you don't just run after them and chase them. I mean, that's what they want you to do. They want you to come after them, chase them, reach with both hands so they can blow you off your feet. So you have to be more methodical in your stance. You have to keep a much better stance as you're stalking them, as we say, and closing the gap. And, I mean, that, that was my – Advice to John is you can't chase Ed Ruth. You've got to keep your hands low. You've got to get a hand on him, a thumb on him first, then touch hands, then touch heads. Then you can get your hands on him. But if you just run after him and reach with both hands, he's going to you know, he's gonna blow you off your feet. Hmm. Let me ask you, if, if you uh, had an opportunity uh, to handpick any one of these guys to spend one year one-on-one -on -one with, knowing what you could do with them, their talents, their abilities, uh, their desire to learn, their openness to <laughs> learn, uh, I think is huge. You know, it's one thing to be a sponge, but to be able to retain that amount of water in the right amount of water, I think that's a big deal, don't you? Uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a very big deal. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of tough. You put me on the spot to answer that question, but I'm going to answer it. Wow. Wow. Um, I think, first of all, you know, we did pick that young man in Kyle Snyder, um, and we brought him to the Olympic Training Center his senior year in high school, and he trained with Dustin Kilgore and John Reeder in a full-time freestyle environment. You know, we took him all around the world. Um, we did, you know, Coach Zadik and I, we did pour um, our experience and, and our lives and technique into him, and clearly he went off to Ohio State, got second in the NCAAs, and as we know now, end up making history by being the youngest American to ever win a world title. So I feel like we had the opportunity to do that in the past, and, and fortunately we were able to do it. You know, it, it, If I had to do it again moving forward, if I could do that again, um, the first guy that comes to my mind is I would choose Nick Muskowski. Um, I'd choose Wiz. Wow. 
um, because I think he has the right attitude, the right work ethic, and you know, I've, I've, I took him to Spain this summer as his very first international tournament, and he ended up winning it. He beat a, a tough Chinese guy in the finals who's wrestled in the Olympics, wrestled many world championships. Wiz was down 8-0. And my advice to him at the break was just go get one takedown. He went and got one takedown, eight to two. Hey, Wiz, go get one more takedown. You got another takedown, eight to four. And then all of a sudden he started catching some confidence. Go get one more takedown, eight to six. And then he realized he could beat that guy. And he came, he came from behind, ended up taking him down, broke the guy, and pinned him in the last 20 seconds of the match. So that was his first international tournament. Comes from behind 8-0 and wins the tournament. This is his second international tournament at the Bill Farrell International and wins the tournament and has some big wins along the way. So he's clearly somebody that he can – he's got a great attitude, great work ethic, and he can attack and he can score points. And so uh, Travell is clearly our number one guy right now, but but definitely Wiz is somebody that in the future at heavyweight, you know, whenever you – know, he's going to challenge Travell now, but, you know, whenever Travell decides to, to move on with his life, I think Wiz is, is definitely one of our uh, future heavyweights who it's can make an impact on the pick. world. It's a neat pick. Uh, I think he is one of the most talented uh, big men in the country. Uh, perhaps he's that next step for us. I, I truly believe that we have um, some some options at the heavyweight we haven't had in the years past. And uh, one of them, Ty Walls. One of them, of course, uh, Gwiz. The other, Adam Kuhn. When Adam Kuhn starts believing in himself, and he had a good performance in New York too, but, uh, you know, look, look at the competition between Walls and Coons at the All-Star Classic. You know, we saw two totally different wrestlers in Coon between Atlanta and New York. And I, I like I like what I'm seeing on a variety of different fronts, uh, especially the big men. Big men can be so exciting when they want to be. And it doesn't have to be as, as, as Gwiz once typified as being dancing bears. They don't have to be <laughs> dancing bears. You know? No, it doesn't have to be the, the tail of the whale. Um, it... it can be exciting mm -hmm. if these heavyweights are coached appropriately, if, if they're coached how to hand fight, how to clear ties, clear collar ties, clear underhooks, get to the leg, get two hands to the leg, get to their feet and finish, then it could be really exciting watching heavyweight matches. I mean, for anybody who watched our heavyweight matches this last weekend at the Bill Farrell, there were some great heavyweight matches. Yeah. Tony Nelson had a big win right over Ty Tyrell Fortune. Um, you know, Wiz had scored lots of points out there. So it, it doesn't have to just be a heavyweight, um, you know, the battle of the cattle, as we used to say <laughs> back in Texas. It doesn't have to be that. It doesn't. Uh, it could be really exciting. And so and I think, again, that's a guy like Wiz. He, he makes it exciting, and he's a fun guy to coach. Oh, the Bill Farrell International is one for the record books. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about 2014 World Bronze Medalist Beksad Abdurakmanov of Uzbekistan, the lone foreign champ <laughs> of the competition. He defeated Danny Valamont. Uh, it was 10-0 at 74 kilos, but um, you have to, I think, tip your cap to a guy like Daksad to be able to wrestle as hard as he did, defeating a very talented young man in Dan Valamont. What are your thoughts on that performance? Well, I think he wrestled really well, and, and I say it respectfully and candidly, but, um, you know, Beksad, he wrestles for Uzbekistan. Um, so uh, we're going to spend time scouting him and preparing yeah. to beat him, but um, we're not gonna, I'm not going to spend a lot of time developing him. There you go. That's so, you know, Dan, Dan Belmont is that – was, that was a good win for him against Nick Maribel in the semis. I mean, I think probably for him, that's probably the best win of his life. What probably. did that – yeah, exactly. What did that What did that say to everybody? What was – what did the performance and the victory over Maribel? Because if you recall, Maribel's got the only U.S. victory against uh, right. uh, uh, Jordan Burroughs. So it seems to me that's a step up the ladder, at least in the right direction. Yeah, I, I'm sure that – I'm sure that Nick – uh, clearly was upset with that loss. I'm sure he went into that tournament planning on winning it. And to lose that match, um, you know, I'm sure it was tough for him to swallow. But again, he, he needs to kind of learn lessons from that and, and get kind of focused again heading into December to, quali to qualify you know, for the Olympic trials. But you know, again, for Dan Valmont, I'm sure that, that infused a lot of confidence in him. I've already received from text, text from him the last two days. He's excited on going on some international tours now, deciding which one is the best. So again, the overall responsibility of coaching Team USA is we can't clearly just focus on you know, Jordan Burroughs and Kyle Snyder. I mean, those are reigning world champs, and we're very proud and excited for them. But we have, we have to develop the whole entire um, 
group of American wrestlers and make sure that the Dan Belmonts, the Nick Maribels, and the and the Wizzes and the you know the Tyler Graffs and the Aaron Picos. I mean, I could keep naming clearly all of our wrestlers, but we got to make sure that that all of them are continuing to develop. And that's why we have these camps out here. It's because we want to get these guys training with Coach Burnett, Coach Zadik, and myself to make sure they're learning the proper technique to be the best in the world, but also training with each other, just you know, iron sharpening iron, learning lessons from each other. Because, I mean, having our guys get around Jordan Bros and get around Kyle Snyder here at this camp, they learn a lot of lessons uh, from them as well as our coaching staff. And we go live today. We wrestle 10 minutes live on our feet and 10 minutes live on the mat. Just that 20 minutes of live wrestling with – you know, our national team, our world champions, you know, it was great for all the guys in and around their weight classes. Hmm. It's always fun to talk to you about your uh, just a wealth of knowledge and the passion you have for the sport is so evident. And, uh, and I'm awfully glad we have you. Awfully glad Thank we you. have you. Assistant national coach indeed. Brandon Slay has been our guest in the Nike hot seat today from uh, his, uh, his coach sitting in the parking lot <laughs> of the, <laughs> you like that? from uh, the parking lot of the United States Olympic Training Center. It's always good to see you. Have fun in Nice, France, okay? Uh, I will, I tell you. I'd much rather be going to Nice than Baku, Azerbaijan. So yeah. uh, I got the good end of the stick on that one. Do me a favor. Pick me up a selection of fine cheese <laughs> and a bottle of red. I'd be happy uh, man. I'll see if I can do that. Thank right. you very much for, for the opportunity, Scott. Take always care. Always good. Brandon Slay, Olympic gold medalist, joining us on the program. Thanks for watching.